My name is Anna Sverkling Taylor. I'm a uh, games researcher here in Skövde, and I have the pleasure to uh, present Johan Örneblad. He's an innovation lawyer um, at Bergestråle and Partners, and he will present a talk uh, named How to Define, Build and Protect Value in Gaming Companies, Tools, Real Life Examples and Battle Stories. Welcome. Thank you. Yeah, great, great to see so many of you at the, uh, the kind of the last one, the last talk on a on a Friday afternoon. It's great to have you here, though. Um, I don't know how many of you that were at the uh, the talk by Frederick Wester this uh, this morning, but the, this is a <laughs> a picture from from his talk where he he kind of had a, a really really interesting view into game design, which, which I really like, where he talked about that there is a connection between, if, well, between business and the creative side of, of, uh, of making games. The more money you get, the better games you can, you can do, most of the times at least. And some of the things that, that, that I'll go through here today is to enable you to capture the value that you actually create and making sure that the value flows back to you, the money comes back to you, and not spread to, to other people that, that take advantage of the games that you make. I'm, I'm aware of that. Uh, as, a, as a really new and, and small startup, some of these things are not as easy to do, because, I mean, some of them are costly. But it's also important to think about those things from the beginning and, and start building a company and an, ad, and an idea that strive to something much bigger. Not necessarily investing too much in the beginning, but at least building a structure for it. And one, uh, one other premise which is really, really important is about controlling your assets. And by controlling, I don't mean blocking or stopping other people from doing things. But con control to me is about you being in charge of, you can decide who can do what. If you have control over your game, you can enable Let's Play vid videos and they can do what you decide that they can do with it. And you can let other people use your IP. So I think that, that's an important part of it. I'm, I'm definitely not for blocking anyone to do anything or, or, or not allowing the community to, to use some of the things that you create. Continuing from, from the kind of the business ang angle, I like to see that a game is really a brand. You're building a brand with a game. But in order to think about how you build it, you need to take a step back and think about what is a brand. And usually, a brand, you could say, well, it's a logo. Well, no, it's not really a logo. It is a gut feeling. Your feeling of wow, this is really, really what this is about. You, you think about different things and you, you imagine it in your head or you feel it, you see the, the brand maybe even as a little creature that behaves in a certain way, that talks in a certain way. So it's important to think about that the brand is not a, what you say it is. Even though you think that your game speaks in a certain way or this is a way that we would like to portray, portray ourselves, it really is about what the other people expect or, 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 or read into the way you communicate. So it's all about what they say. And with that, with that premise, with that starting point, uh, one example out of the gaming world, but, but a, a kind of really big and important example is IKEA. And we're looking at IKEA, all of these things uh, build the image of IKEA that you have in your head. IKEA is not only the logo, and it's not only the, the blue and yellow uh, big retail stores. It's not the flat packs, but all of it make up the, the brand. <coughs> and even games can be brands. You all know Tetris, and Tetris had had, have had a lot of different iterations. Tet Tetris is a, is a good example of a brand that has, has lived for a very long time and they've also managed to keep a quite good control over the brand. So that, that's, why, that's why I'm using that as an example. And I mean, 
they've really used it in order to make a lot of different lot of different products out of the same brand. But the important thing is that they've still kept the kept the brand together, kept the story together of what is the brand, what is it that that they're trying to communicate and how they communicate it. And when you've done that, this is a Swedish example, but for the Swedes in the audience, you do know, or most likely at least, you do know what the brand behind this advert is. It's the, uh, the sports retailer stadium. But you can't, see the, um, you can't see their logo anywhere on the pictures, but you still know it. And that's the sort of feeling that you, would that you should inspire with your games, with your brand. It should be clear and it should be uh, consistent in a way that people can see certain assets, certain elements, and still feel that, wow, yeah, this is, this is really this game, or this is really uh, on brand. And when looking at different examples, I mean, you can just go through these different names. And all of them, for all of them, I think you can visualize and think about, well, what the gameplay looks like, maybe what the logo looks like. Possibly you've seen some merchandise, you've seen some other things that all build up into the brand. Could even be the story, could be the story or, or the, the debate about Grand Theft Auto and, and running people over. Well, maybe that is part of the story about the brand. Maybe that is part of what people talk about to create the brand about the game. And all of those things kind of, they, they merge into what the brand is and how the brand is interpreted. In the same way, <coughs> this is not an example, Zelda, different, different assets that make up the, the brand image of the game. And they're all, I mean, the, the Monopoly game, yes, they've extended the brand into to Monopoly, but it's also the logo, it's the, the gameplay, it's the, the, uh, the figures, the, um, the creatures, no, the, the persons in the game. All of those make up important assets in building the brand. But building a brand is all very well, and, and you, I do think you really should think about building a brand. But without the question, or without an answer to the question why, it's really difficult to build a brand that will serve your business goals. Because going back to what Frederick Vester from Paradox said this morning, is that it's the business strategy that should guide you on what actions you should take. Together with the crea creative side, and they should, they should work together, and you should be like, well, if I do this creative thing, then this will strengthen my business strategy. It's the same way here. You should build a brand with different assets in order to strengthen the business side. It's an example of how certain assets are, are merged into other games. It's, it's, it's an example of one extension. But I'm sure you have loads of different other examples on how assets from one game is used in another. The only important thing is there that that you should still have control over your brand. You need to be in charge of what assets someone else can use and how they use it, in what way. Because it's still your brand, it still talks about your game. If it's not used in the right way, then it diminishes your brand and you've let go of a really very important asset. <coughs> The, yeah, the, I mean, it, it is really key to, to keep on brand, keep it. Could you, could you and should you do collaborations in a certain way? Well, should you use one game in a, one game that is, or one game asset that is, that is directed to adults in a very typical uh, children's game? Well, maybe not, because that doesn't work. Or maybe that is a way to strengthen the brand. It's all about the business strategy and whether it makes sense. But without control, you're not able to do it. Without control, you're not able to do these, these collaborations and draw, draw from the strengths, strengths in your brand. One other reason why you need control over your brand <coughs> is clones. 
for different games, different, different types of games, this is a more or less big problem. This is an example from um, apps that I, that I found earlier in the week uh, when I searched for uh, Farmville. These are all games, and as you can see, Farmville is not one of them. These are all games that, in one way or the other, picks up assets from Farmwell. In a way, they could, they could have copied straight the, the, uh, the game assets and included them, but it could also be that they, they use the names, they use other assets. I call these, this type leechers. They, they are pure clones. And in almost all cases, I argue that you should take action against them, because they they leech on your brand. They take, take the assets that you've created, the value that you've created, and they try to monetize from it without adding anything. These rarely add anything, if the game even works. So that, that's why it is really important to take action against them, to monitor and take action. But there are also other types of games that draw from what you've create, created. They can be games that not necessarily actually copy what you've done, but they draw inspiration. These three games are similar games to Angry Birds, or at least they draw either some design prin principles or some game ideas from Angry Birds. These could sometimes be okay. These could even be good because they advance the game genre. You're the first one in this game genre, and it's, it's great that there are two, three other games that, that help, uh, help advance it and help promote it. Maybe it's a new way of, of playing, or it's a, it's a new device even. But it's also important to know which these are and think about what have they copied. Because sometimes they've actually taken one of your assets. In one of these games, maybe they've taken uh, one of the birds from Angry Birds, but all the other things are different then it's still something that you need to look at and think about, well, is, is this a, something that we don't like? Something that takes away the value that we've created? And I think sometimes it is and sometimes it isn't. <coughs> then sometimes you end up in court. I'm a lawyer, I, I, but I don't really like ending up in court because I think that really is the last resort. But some of the, some of the more high-profile things that you read about, they do end up in court. This specific case settled out of court after a while. But the judge, he said, you can read it there, but, it, but the, the judge said before they settled, so they, they agreed outside of court and the clone took down their game, or at least that was the result. We don't know what they agreed. But in this case, the clone had not specifically copied any assets, any game elements, but they had copied how the game worked. They had copied that if you combine certain things, they evolve in different stages, and the different stages were very, very similar. So it is important to also think about that if you've introduced a new mechanics or a new thing into the gaming world, then also those things are, are your creations, something that, that you've spent time and, and money, but, but, but probably mainly time in developing. And those are things that would be part of your business strategy to, to keep, at least for yourself for a while, or to be in charge of or in control over who can use them. <coughs> if you Google, th there are some example, examples of this, and, and uh, as a kind of, <laughs> rule of thumb, then, well, you shouldn't copy anything, obviously, but, but ideas are okay to copy, expressions are not. It's important also for you, I'll, I'll get to that a bit later, but it's also important for you to think about not being too inspired by other, by other games. I, I can't really give you a very simple solution or a simple answer to what you can do or what you can't do, but uh, Usually, don't copy graphics. That, that's a very, very simple answer. Or don't copy graphics, don't copy names, don't copy sounds. You could possibly get inspiration from the game mechanics. 
but the more of the game mechanics you use from another, from another game, the closer you get to that it is a copy. It's a sliding scale, but then it's mo probably better to, to try to be a bit more creative yourself and, and uh, do something, something less similar. One other aspect that is really important from a brand sense is the name of your game. Could be the name of your studio as well, but the name of the game in this case, because your studio is, is a different brand, is, is also a could also kind of draw from these, these principles. But from a, a game perspective, it is really, really important for two reasons. It's important that you, that you can use your name worldwide, because most of you have a worldwide market, so you should be able to use it worldwide. You can do a Google search. That is a very simple first way to look at, are there any games that, that are called something similar to this, or someone in the gaming sphere doing something similar? There could be more in-depth searches and looking at registrations and stuff, but at least doing your own clearance search, looking for what's there, is really, really important. Because otherwise, it's like these two games, where they released, or possibly announced, when someone else came up and said, well, we actually think that your name is too close to the, um, the name that we have on our product. In the first example, it was the, uh, the, uh, the British broadcaster Sky that thought that their trademark Sky was too similar to No Man's Sky. We can argue whether that is true or, or, or whether that's the case, but they had that is, a, that, that is an example of where there could be an obstacle that either, I don't know whether they for, foresaw it or not, but they, it, at least it appeared. And unless you're a really, really big developer, then sure, you can spend loads of money on fighting it, but if you instead from the beginning would have chosen a different name that would be less likely to, to infringe someone else's name or, or less likely to be in conflict with someone else's name. That is probably much, much better spent money. And a similar thing was for <coughs> Fabulous Beasts. Uh, Warner Brothers thought, thought that, they, uh, that that was too close to, another, to one of their registered marks for Fantastic Beasts. So they had to change for Beasts of Balance. I don't know whether that was a big problem for them or not, but they had invested a lot of time and energy in developing that brand all the way until they had to change it. And, I mean, their players knew them as, as something else, and changing a name is not great when you, when you need reoccurring players. The two aspects, this is one way that we do it, but the two aspects are really, could you register the name? Could you yourself claim ownership of the name or do a trademark registration. But the other one is also, could you actually use it? They're not necessarily the same. And it's always on a sliding scale. How big chance is it that someone would oppose this? How big chance is it that someone would have a problem with it? Well, we can't say 100%, or we can't say, well, no one will ever have a problem with this. But it is a sliding scale. And it's important to, to quantify that in a way in order to make an informed business decision, whether that is a risk that you're willing to take. Going back to the different assets, thinking about the Zelda exam example with different assets for a game. How do you then control these different assets in a game? <coughs> this is a, um, an example on different tools that you could use to control your, your brand, control the different assets within the, the brand of the game. Trademark is a good way of, of controlling both names and graphical assets that you would use as a, well, as a name or something that, signifi that, that signifies the game. In this case, it's an app logo. I don't know whether these are, we, whether these are actually trademarked or not. I, I'm guessing they would be, but, but I, I don't know. But registering a, an app logo as a trademark will limit other people from doing similar logos. Like we saw with the Farmville, ex Farmville example. All those, all those logos, 
let's see where we are there. All of these, if Farmwell had registered, it's highly likely that, that quite a few of these would have been too close. They would have been confusingly similar. So someone looking at them wouldn't really understand which is the, which is the correct one. That could be an, a fairly easy step in order to, to control the assets that you have, the assets that you build and create. Obviously, a trademark for the, uh, for the, actual, um, the actual logo, that's a very straightforward common way of doing it. You could also register a trademark for the actual name or for the tagline. And you do register it per country or per, per jurisdiction. So it, it will also have to think about where in the world would you, would you like these, these rights to be, uh, to be controlled. Then for the, for the look of the game, you could register it as a copyright. Here it's exemplified with, with some musical notes, but you could also register in the US your copyright for the game and for which would include the graphical elements. You have copyright on your game irrespective of whether you register it or not. In Sweden you don't have to register, you can't even register. In the US it is an option and it is a must in order to enforce against someone else doing an infringement, but you could also do that just before you file a case. But it is an important way of capturing the value. If you are looking for investment or if you are looking for, for something else, then, or, or to, to sell your business or something like that, then it is really important to show what is it that I've created, what is it that I have. If you have a registered right on, for your code and for your, for your graphical elements, then you, can, then you can list that. That is part of the, the, the pre-sale process, it, listing all the assets and having them on paper. For for, for, um, for, for the game as well, you could register in Europe, possibly in the US, but in Europe, uh, register design rights for the graphical elements in the game. This is, the <coughs> this is a map for, for one of King's games, I guess. Um, it is a tool that you can use. I think it is a quite powerful tool in order to take down clones from Facebook and Google, for instance. You could also sue for it, of course, but, but especially to, to monitor online and to monitor for, for other uh, websites and, and other clones. And as you can see here, I don't know how, how sharp it is out there, but these are different of these assets. And we looked at EA, Supercell, Epic Games, HTC Vive, King, Ubisoft, Crytek, Oculus VR, and Toby. It's a, it's a fairly broad range. Not all of them are pure gaming companies, but they're operating in the, same, in the same area or are maybe partners or collaborators, which is also important to think about because in collaborations, it's important to know what you own and what your partner owns. The, the important takeaway from this is that not all companies are doing this in a st strategic or, or worked through way or thought through way. And some of them are doing it in quite a different way as well. Or they're doing it, they're not, it's, not a, it's not a one common strategy to do it. <coughs> I think it also, I mean, you can see that King has done quite a lot of design registrations and, and some of them have filed for patents. It also depends on how much hardware you do, how much back end you develop. Because obviously, for patents, you would need some technical aspect, most likely at least. And it also depends on where you think your main market is and who your collaborate, collaboration partners are. If you would collaborate with Toby with 117 patents and applications, well, maybe you should think about maybe if you have developed something in eye tracking yourself because otherwise they would own all the technology and all the things that you've created, or they would at least have a quite hard position or quite a, quite a tough position there. Registered copyrights is also used quite, quite differently in different companies, depending, I think, mainly on whether they're based in the US or not. But it, it, is, a, it is another tool to use. One way that we use in order to identify what assets are really important. Do we control them? 
and how, what are the next steps in order to control them, is to use a matrix like this, where control is on one, uh, one axis and importance is on another axis. So ed adding the Zelda trademark, this would be a trademark that would, the placement of this one represents that it is a very valuable trademark and we also have quite a good control position over it. But looking at your, your own assets in a, in a similar way would give you an idea of whether there are some assets that you need to look at. Well, this is a really important asset for us, but we don't even have a, have a trademark filed for it. Well, maybe we should think about if this, would, if this would be something that we should do or what would happen if someone else came up and said that we, that we couldn't use it. I really like visualization, so it, it, is a, it is one tool to do it, but I think it is a very powerful way of doing it. It's also a good, good tool to use in, in, uh, in management documents or, or, or board presentations in order to show that we have actually captured the value in the company. My last slide. This is, if, if, if you're going to remember something, this is the one you, you should remember. Because this is a very, very high level, but it's a very high level action list. I see three different, three, three typical stages where you would do different things. Obviously, it really depends on the size of the company and what you do and the budget and all of that. But it is important that early in the development, be really clear on what you own. What are these assets that you are going to create and that you are creating is owned by the company? Is owned by possibly someone that, that just joined the company? Have you used consultants to do it? Did you download some graphics online? Are you building poor so on a solid, gr solid ground or not? Make sure that you choose a name that you can actually use and that you actually can register in all the markets that you would like to use it, i.e. worldwide, most likely. At this stage, you could also consider registering the mark, filing for the first registration for a trademark, but that would be a budget thing, obviously. Of course, you need to think about, is this the, the best invested uh, money at this stage or not? But it's one option to do it already there. The big gaming companies, they file for trademarks as soon as they've decide, decided what the, um, what the game is going to be called. Sometimes they... they actually wait to decide the name until quite late in the process. But they file for trademark registration as soon as they've decided. And also, make sure you don't borrow too much from other games. Just before launch, you look at the same things sort of again. But you should consider registering the, the, the name and logo as a trademark in order, to, in order to protect it. You should also decide, you should also do the the identification process of the key, key assets. Maybe during development you've developed this one creature that is so important in the game and that you, will, that you see that it will possibly be used for collaborations. The, the goat maybe, in this case, that we saw before. And maybe you should try to register that in some way. Maybe you should find a way to protect it or at least define what you can do with it and, and you, what you can't do with it. I also recommend that you should file for a copyright registration in the US for the, uh, the first launch of the, of, the, uh, of the game. That sets a, a clear, ben, clear kind of uh, mark when you completed the game and it, al it is also a presumption that you owned everything in there. Um, it's a very simple process, doesn't cost that much, but it's just important to think about what you actually file and how you do it in order to get the, the correct protection. Then you can file subsequent updates and, and continue filing new updates, but that first one is really important in order to, to kind of put a baseline. After launch, <coughs> continue monitoring what happens. Are there clones coming up? What are they doing? How, does, how do they work? Are they a problem for you? Should you enforce against, enforce against them? Could be as easy as filing a DMCA takedown with, with well, Facebook, Facebook doesn't really do that, but Apple or, or Google, for instance could be a way to just get them taken down or have them change their name or have them remove some of the game assets because you think they infringe. But also important, after the launch, be, be very clear on what partners can do. What can partners do with your assets? How are they allowed to use it? How are publishers allowed to use the assets? 
are they allowed to register your trademarks if you haven't registered it in a, in a, certain, in a certain jurisdiction? If they have, will you be, be able to take, to take them or to, to, um, to acquire them or to... Could they be transferred to you if you, uh, if you don't use that publisher anymore? It's a, it's a continuous process that is really important to think about and always, always align it with, uh, with business strategy. So that was my, uh, that was my, uh, my last slide. Um, please uh, follow me on Twitter and um, add me on LinkedIn. And I'll, uh, I'll, uh, I will post the, uh, the slides somewhere as well so you can uh, download them and, and, uh, and look at them again if you like. Thank you. So, perhaps time uh, for a couple of questions. If anyone has any questions. Hi, yeah. I'm just wondering from a professional point of view. Uh, Could you turn up the, uh, the mic there, please? Okay, better? Yeah. yeah. Uh, I'm wondering from a professional point of view, do you wish that people register in Sweden first or like go globally with their brands uh, from the start? Is it a pure, purely economic question or do you think it's... It, it comes back to the business strategy, of course. But, yeah, I mean, it is a budget question as well. It, you, usually, it's not really economical to file for trademark registration in Sweden first. If you think that you would like to get a European one after it, then I definitely recommend to do a European filing. And then, then you have six months to go international and still claim that, that first date as the, as the filing date. But it's, um, it really comes, comes down to what, in what stage you are and, and what the market is and how the mar what the market looks like and, and also how, how fast you'll move. Because sometimes it could be too good to file in a very cheap location first and then you have six months to see whether you'd like to spend any more money on this brand or not. That could also be a strategy that could be, could be more, more viable for some, uh, for some companies. Thank you. Any other questions? Cool. If you have any uh, any other questions afterwards, don't don't hesitate to send me an email, and I'll uh, I'll uh, let you know if I can answer or not. But uh, but I'll definitely reply at least. Thank you very much for a very interesting uh, talk and uh, certainly an important topic for the people joining this conference. Yes. Thank you very much. Thank you.